All right, hello friends of bliss. We are back uh, with uh, this uh, month's edition of uh, What's in Your Box. We have obviously changed locales, um, uh, coming to you live from the uh, scenic intersection of Arguello Boulevard and Balboa Avenue, AKA Andre's Rooftop. Um, uh, we are just uh, 48 blocks from the Pacific Ocean, directly, uh, directly behind me. And once again, I am joined by my good friend, Allison Gorsuch. Hi. Hello. Fresh off uh, ye old uh, UNITED flight from St. Louis. And um, for anybody that uh, has not uh, met Allison before, she was the uh, former uh, beverage director at places like the Beverly Hills Hotel, at the Farmhouse Inn. She's a professional wine writer. She writes the newsletters that hopefully you are reading every uh, month. And uh, she is also um, uh, someone that has spent a little bit of uh, time I in, have, yeah. in the place that we are taking you to today. So, Allison, where are we in the world today? We are in Adelaide Hills um, in uh, South Australia. So that way and then way that way. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, a uh, really cool opportunity because um, uh, how did you how did you get to Australia, first of all? Uh, so I went um, <laughs> for the Olympics in the year 2000. I'll date myself Don't a little worry. bit, um, but uh, for six months after you graduate from university, they'll give you a four month work visa. So I took the opportunity to go over and work in Sydney. And then uh, being a girl from St. Louis, I decided to get a job on a boat. <laughs> At a casino? Um, <laughs> no, like in, in the Whitsunday Islands for oh. the Great Barrier Reef. Wow. Um, but um, I, uh, I, I ended up marrying an Australian uh, for a, a short, period of time um, but uh, we we traveled a lot so I've seen as much of Australia as I have of the United States cool ironically the one part that I did not go to is Adelaide oh so you mean <laughs> to tell me that uh, you mean to tell me that I've actually been here three times and you have Correct. I'm beating you at something Aussie Wow, <laughs> that never happens uh, so a little background uh, back in 2019 I decided to uh, do one of these little uh, research slash scouting trips uh, and it took me to Australia where I met um, uh, a couple of uh, gentlemen named uh, Damon and Jono Kerner. Uh, Jono being short for Jonathan. Right. Um, you know how the Aussies do, right? Yep. Yeah, everything ends in a no. So I met them uh, before this project was really even up and running, um, specifically in their uh, family's uh, um, longtime uh, winery in uh, the Clare Valley. Uh, but uh, we work with uh, three of their wines now, uh, three of their wineries, and today we're bringing you Lico, just in time for the summertime, uh, which is their project in the Adelaide Hills. And what is Lico exactly? Well, funny you ask. <laughs> Lico exactly stands for Lenswood Kerner. Um, uh, Lenswood is one of the most historic vineyards in, uh, um, Lenswood and Piccadilly are the two of the most historic vineyards in this part of Australia. Um, uh, Kerner obviously stands for their family name. And uh, this is um, ironically outside of Tasmania, um, the coldest wine growing region in, uh, South Aus in Australia in general. Hence, we're sitting here on the roof talking about it. Um, in the wind. <laughs> in the wind, exactly. <laughs> it is uh, one of the windier parts of uh, the area. And as a result, they are uh, playing around um, and succeeding at some really great examples of cold climate winemaking in a place that you don't typically think of as being cold at all. So uh, today we have uh, four wines for you. Uh, all of them are going to be uh, farmed um, organically. Uh, all of them are uh, wines that uh, have a, a distinctive kind of a very Kerner Brothers kind of a touch to them. Uh, we'll explain why in a second. And uh, all of these are uh, pretty, uh, pretty exclusive. Uh, there's not a ton made, um, uh, about 3,000 bottles or so uh, for uh, each of the uh, wines. So we wanted to bring you something that's uh, truly cool, expressive, and indicative of South Australia and Australia in general today. Well, yeah, and I think just uh, highlighting the fact that a lot of winemakers now, and especially over the last decade, have really started to experiment and play around. And so it's really kind of refreshing to see some of these grape varieties that I wouldn't expect to come from that area. Right. So, Allison, when you lived in Australia, mm -hmm. can you give us a few kind of uh, words on uh, what your experiences were with wine? when you lived in Australia, yep. and then when you came back to the United States and managed some of these uh, beverage programs, uh, what your perceptions of Australian wines were when you got back home? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to um, spend a week in Margaret River, which, you know, at the time was probably, you know, the 
the most reputable place at the time. Um, and uh, the wines were fantastic and they were starting to experiment a little bit, but it was still Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc and um, your standard grape varieties. Um, in the rest of uh, Australia, I mean, first of all, they really only like to drink their own wine, <laughs> which is fair. Um, but I think um, what there do you wasn't. Mean there's not a ton of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc in not, Australia. Not a lot, no. But they're so close to each other. <laughs> they're basically the same country, aren't they? Yeah, pretty much. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah, try to tell that to anybody in either place. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So um, so it was really mostly just local. So you go to your bottle o <laughs> <laughs> your local bottle shop and just pick up an eight dollar shiraz or you know a grenache or what have you they did drink a lot of dry riesling um, mm -hmm. but i think then when i came back um, australian wine didn't have like a middle tier market it was either really inexpensive like obviously yellowtail is the first thing that comes to mind it was the only wine i could get when i did a summer in alaska which was tragic um, not you know, the yellowtail, not the Alaska part. Mm. Um, but then there's, you know, really, really high end stuff, but there didn't really seem to be a lot of middle tier for, for my wine lists. Um, and so again, it's kind of nice to see something coming in to fill that gap in the market. Awesome. And uh, would you say that uh, Australian uh, winemakers um, in general are a, a pretty conservative bunch or are they pretty adventurous when it comes to uh, what they do? I mean, I think they're pretty adventurous. I think the best part about, you know, a lot of Australian winemakers is that they almost all take time to go to other parts of the world. So they have innovative winemaking styles, but it's all rooted in very classic winemaking. Um, so oh. I think that's really impressive. Funny you say that. <laughs> so um, uh, that was a really fun segue um, to introducing uh, kind of how Damon and Jono uh, started their wine career as uh, winemakers that traveled around. And uh, one of the places that they uh, settled in on uh, was uh, the island of Corsica. Um, uh, that's why you see a lot of uh, Italian varietals in their arsenal, um, as well as French winemaking styles uh, brought back home to Australia. Uh, if you uh, peruse our website, you'll also see a couple other brands from them, oh, yeah. um, such as Brothers Kerner. Uh, this is their uh, largest production style. Um, uh, this is uh, pretty easy drinking, but uh, very technically precise, clean, delicious wines from either Adelaide Hills or Clare Valley. Or their flagship, <laughs> Kerner Wines, uh, much rarer. Um, and these are really kind of the creme de la creme, a little bit more on the um, uh, influenced by uh, their roots in uh, Corsica winemaking style and also a little bit more on the natural and a little bit more on the uh, concentrated powerful side coming from Clare Valley. But today we're here about to talk about Lico. So uh, let's start to drink. Let's do. All right. Um, so can I just toss this? Yeah, it's we're on the roof. Hey. Um, all right. So it's a little windy. We have to actually have wine in the glass. I know. To keep the glass on the table. Oh, good old San Francisco <laughs> summers. You know what they say? The coldest winter you ever spent is a summer in San Francisco. <laughs> yep. So let's talk about the Blanc. Um, yes. Um, Blanc um, is on the label. Um, if anybody wants to get into super nerdy reasons why they don't just put Sauvignon, because um, it's 95% Sauvignon and 5% Chardonnay. Um, if you wanted to put the whole variety on the label, um, kind of had to do 100%. Uh, but uh, this is a wine that is, uh, if you look at it, it's unfiltered. You can see it's a little cloudy. Um, and it really has a nice, beautiful, deep yellow color. Um, it has this uh, kind of a, a straw, but a very kind of a golden hue to it. Does. it. Allison, why, why, why is that? I believe, Andre, that is from Skin Contact. Oh, <gasps> no <laughs> shit. Um, so this is a uh, wine that, um, I love their descriptions, by the way. You know, I quote other people when they are much more, um, uh, not as verbose and a little bit more to the point than I am, which is most of the time. Uh, they quit, uh, qu uh, quote it as a Skin Contact Hills Blend, exotic, spicy, and crisp. Um, Almost like a little lemony tiny lemon component, yeah, which I think is really complimentary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, 20 days on the skins um, gives it that beautiful texture, the color, um, and it's an uh, awesome uh, wine to uh, just uh, enjoy either on its own or, like I said, with uh, richer styles of, uh, of seafood. seafood. Yeah. yeah. Barramundi and scallops. Ooh. Sign me up. I ah. think I'm getting hungry. It's get almost time for dinner. It's <laughs> as the sun is telling us. We. Oui. Um, all right. Uh, shall we uh, do the uh, the ceremonial? Splash? Yes, we shall. Well, it's not windy. 
<laughs> I don't want that to come back at me. Uh, so the next wine that we're... May I? Please. So the next wine that we're uh, going to uh, talk to you about is the Lico Rosé. Um, and the Rosé is um, a wine that is very, very much a... Um, nod to the Kerner brothers uh, influence from Corsica. Mm -hmm. um, in Corsica, which is technically French, uh, but uh, is very close to Italy, uh, they uh, do a variety of different um, uh, type of uh, grapes, uh, some of which we know more from, from the Italian side. Right. They usually tend to have different names. Yep, they sure do. But uh, with a very, very kind of a distinctly French, very refined style of winemaking. So if you like rosé from, like, let's say, the, the Provence region of France, mm -hmm. totally right up that alley, but made with Nulicchio. How about is that? Is that how you say that? <laughs> Nulicchio. No. Nulicchio, you see. <laughs> yeah. Which is just a fancy synonym for Sangiovese. Sangiovese? <laughs> From uh, from Australia? Ah, all right. Now we're playing. Uh, they describe it as a bone dry rose, aromatic, spicy, and with great texture. Man, they're good at these descriptions. They really are. Very right? concise and to the point. I like it. Yeah, I should learn this. Uh, these grapes are harvested on April 6th, so uh, that is about two weeks later than the uh, the white grapes. And uh, just remember that we are in the southern hemisphere, so you're wondering April, what the hell? Um, just add right. six months. So essentially it's the equivalent of October the 6th, so pretty late. Um, uh, they are uh, crushed and destemmed, and they spend absolutely no time on the skins, which tells you exactly how small these berries are to get this amount of color out of uh, grapes that you just literally just press down and uh, then ferment. Um, uh, this is a, a wine that's uh, utilizing a really cool uh, fermentation vessel. Um, Allison. Yeah, I was going to ask about the little concrete eggs huh. um, because I wanted to taste it at first because there is a, a lovely texture here as well. Mm. And so you'd think that if without any skin contact, where would that little bit of tannin be coming from? Mm -hmm. And it's not tannin. It's from the lees, mm -hmm. from the from the convection sort of situation in a concrete egg. Um, it's like really creamy, right? It is. And uh, it's uh, a really cool um, uh, style and technique that is uh, catching on. Uh, there's lots well, of different I mean, ways to make concrete. Frankly, concrete eggs are not inexpensive either. Hmm. So I think maybe that's why it hasn't. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ty. <laughs> caught on so much. <laughs> <laughs> it is cool. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to uh, tell you that San Francisco is a warm climate, yeah, come here for a day. Um, <laughs> uh, it is a wine that uh, is then uh, aged in uh, stainless steel for eight more months, um, fine, filtered, and uh, perfect with, uh, honestly, like I made, uh, you know, Tyler asked me, like, it would be a good uh, time to go into, like, what, what goes well with these wines. Um, so I made, like, a really simple, like, super, super simple, like, oh my God, anybody can do this in 10 minutes. Uh, salad, and uh, it is uh, what my uh, friends have lovingly decided to call Andre salad because it's like the only thing I can actually make. I, I got all my cooking skills from my mom. Sorry, mom. Um, Thank you. So I can basically cut things and measure them. But, I was uh, going to say, is that really cooking? <laughs> yeah, it's just more like uh, cutting and prepping. But thank you. But no, of course. But uh, things like uh, this really kind of fresh salad of tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, and uh, of course, dill. You can't have a Russian um, based <laughs> dish without dill. Um, and a little bit of salt from our friends in Zihuatanejo. Uh, with this, is absolutely, absolutely perfect. And so the idea is that the natural acidity in the rosé plays with the tomatoes. It plays into the herbaceousness of the dill. Well, and I think we, we talk about it often. But oh, damn, that's good. When you are pairing, oftentimes it's good to go to the same place. Mm -hmm. So this is a very Mediterranean salad as well. And we're obviously um, drinking Mediterranean grapes, but not from the Mediterranean. All right. So... As we, uh, no. all right, I can't, I can't not eat this right now, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try. Um, uh, about 4,000 bottles total produ uh, total production. They do add in 5% of Chardonnay, just like with the white wine, essentially to uh, give it a little bit more of that natural, really high level of acidity. 
So it's uh, basically that they're mirror images of each other. Exactly. But this one has skin contact and this one doesn't, which is the outlier. Leave it to Australia to flip <laughs> things upside down. Hey, um, Allison, is that it true? That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> down under, huh? Uh, Allison, is it true that when you flush a toilet in Australia, it spins in the other direction? I, 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 I don't believe that that is true. Damn it, the Simpsons lied about something? <laughs> they did. Uh, all right. Um, OK, so uh, that is the rosé. As much as I hate to say goodbye to it. I know. Mm. I will say one of the best parts of traveling around Australia, though, is that everybody is convinced that where they live, that particular town, is the most beautiful place in Australia, which is really refreshing coming from a St. Louis girl. <laughs> <laughs> what? The gold, the arch is not the, uh, the most scenic place in the world? Um, all right, so if we may, now we are going to move to the dark side of the force. As, uh, You're on fire. What? <laughs> we have three members, proud members of House Slytherin here on this uh, rooftop tonight. <laughs> That's true. The one is behind the camera. <laughs> and uh, we are going to go to Pinot Noir. Um, as uh, Damon and Jono put it, uh, it's Pinot but not overdone. Delicate, fruity, earthy with soft tannins. God, I gotta go to writing school. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, Pinot Noir is something that uh, is a staple in uh, the Adelaide Hills. Um, this is really kind of, I think, what they're known for, Their right? Their go-to, yeah. yeah. Like, when you um, lived in Australia, like, when you thought, like, of Adelaide Hills, was there anything other than Pinot Noir that came to mind? Riesling. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, that's pretty much. Pretty much. That's pretty much it. And uh, so this is uh, coming from um, uh, that uh, other really, really famous vineyard, the Piccadilly Vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, these grapes were harvested on March 8th and 16th. Why? Oh, yeah, right? Super okay. early, that right? It's very early. You know, like, as opposed to, like, you know, basically the cool end of October here, it's a month earlier right. than the Sangiovese. Like, why do you think that is, Al? Well, we kind of are touched upon it slightly, but it, it really is the thickness of the skins. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more and dive into um, the soil types uh, with the next wine with the Rouge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is uh, on clay soils, so it's a much, much colder um, viticultural area. Um, so you don't think about Adelaide Hills. In my mind, I never really thought about it as being as cold as it really is. Um, uh, it is because the, uh, I'm sorry, like, we have good <laughs> produce here. So, like, let's take advantage of it yep. because, damn, these strawberries are absolutely amazing. They really um, are. Strawberries or Pinot Noir are um, almost like one of those hidden secrets that I wish more people would, would get into. Uh, but uh, geography nerds, uh, Adelaide Hills um, is uh, on the eastern slopes of the, uh, the foothills, essentially, of what's called the Mount Lofty Ranges. Um, and the Mount Lofty Ranges are what uh, keeps um, Barossa and all the really other famous regions of South Australia from being bloody hot. Right. And um, uh, it's because there's a uh, body of water there called the Gulf of St. Vincent, which is attached to, um, did you know that we now officially have five oceans in the world? No, I did not. Yeah, last year. The Great Southern was uh, recognized officially as an ocean. <gasps> I did not know Yeah. That. So uh, it's uh, something that feeds right into it. It is a cold body of water, and this is what gives uh, all of these uh, wine-grown regions a really big shift from daytime to nighttime, and it allows us to drink delicious Pinot Noir from here. Um, uh, this is... Uh, it's also the elevation, too, right? Well, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 2,000 oh. 2, feet up is, uh, you know, you put Australia, basically flat as a pancake, <laughs> except for like the, four places. They're, the Blue Mountains are like where they go skiing, and I think 4,000 feet, <laughs> 4,000 meters is as tall as it gets. Meters? No, I think your feet. I, I think, think you're right. right. I feet. think you're right. It is feet. Um, so this, Metric. This is, um, that's another fun fact. Can you name the three countries in the world that do not officially use the metric system? I can name one. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, uh, the other two are Liberia and Burma. You did uh, tell me that one. Yeah, no, so it's, uh, I got that, learned that from Archer. Um, uh, the, uh, this is a really interesting wine because um, it does spend two times, uh, two weeks on the skins in total. Um, it, said it spends 10 months in 2000 liter big old Boudre. So this is not one of those wines that's aged in new oak. Yet it has all of this really beautiful kind of a fruit and a very beautiful kind of like expression of uh, just uh, kind of like slightly herby, slightly red fruited, slightly floral qualities. 
that uh, you know we love about Pinot Noir. Well, and there's a little bit of um, whole, like whole cluster here, right? Mm -hmm. But not with the stems, just whole berry. Whole berry, yeah. Just so it's carbonic, so it has a little bit of that kind of that pop in the yeah. lip. And uh, so let's get nerdy here because, like, you know, for a lot of people, Pinot Noir is a really, you know, it's a favorite grape. Um, it's definitely one that I think most people have heard of. And uh, it's a grape that uh, is so, so incredibly different no matter where you grow it at and right. how you make it. So let's talk a little bit about, like, what makes this wine from Adelaide Hills just a bit different. What do you think about how, how does this differ from, let's say, uh, Russian wine River? from Sonoma? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say my, my six years in Russian River, that's a flavor profile that I would be really, really upset with myself if I got wrong in a blind tasting. <laughs> um, but I mean, Russian River Valley just starts to get much, much riper. So mm -hmm. when I think of Russian River Valley, the first thing that comes to mind is cherry cola or Anderson Valley and Mendocino, um, which just has, you know, longer daylight hours. Um, so there's much, much riper fruit. And then typically they really do like to use um, on, on better bottlings. They like to add to that cherry cola, some vanilla and some oak spice. Um, the other thing um, which you noted is the oak regimen here where with Russian River Valley Pinot Noir, because of the ripeness of the fruit and that cherry cola, oftentimes winemakers want to add the flavors of new oak. Mm. So this has no new oak, and I think that sets it apart as well. Gotcha. So you would say this is a little bit more kind of uh, let the let the fruit um, itself speak for the wine as opposed to then letting letting the other stuff you do to it maybe I was going to say I, 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 manipulate always seems like That's a, a bad you know. a connotation but, but, but you, you can make wine and, and, and still make really delicious wine I mean who doesn't who I mean, to be fair, like who doesn't like a really nice kind of a hedonistic uh, right. bottle of Russian River Valley when it's uh, when it's uh, chilly and uh, kind of you're sitting by the fire, but yeah, a little bit of a different wine. And so, um, uh, moral of the story yep. is, you know, for me, Adelaide Hills, and also there's another really cool region in Australia that makes Pinot Noir, that's Yarra Valley. Um, right. uh, I think that it's a really great uh, kind of in-between for those that really like Burgundy. Um, and appreciate that a little bit more structured, a little bit of that earthier, denser style. And those that love the Russian River and wines from maybe even the Willamette Valley or New Zealand that really like that ripe, juicier fruit style. This has elements of both, and it's a really great uh, opportunity to introduce Pinot Noir uh, to uh, people that are really into one style or the other. And this is a really good, safe go between. Yeah. All right. Let's. Nice uh, is, what did you just learn from your concise notes there? That was really very concise. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> All right, ready? One, two, and dump. All right. So, last but certainly not least, we have the aptly named Rouge. Uh, for those of you that don't speak French, Rouge means red. <laughs> um, you know. I always like to joke about this uh, about Australians. Like, you know, we talk about the French being literal people. Like, you know, the Aussies are incredibly literal. Yes, they are. Yeah, it's like everything when you go to Australia is either a uh, uh, native uh, Aboriginal name or it's like Skullbreaker Beach <laughs> or Remarkable Rocks. Yeah, you think. Um, but uh, so Rouge, um, uh, this is Lico's red wine, and uh, this is a really interesting fun uh, wine that really speaks to where Adelaide Hills is today. Um, uh, there are uh, five grapes here in play. Sometimes there's more. Um, so we're talking about a blend of Pinot Noir, Sangiovese, Merlot, Syrah, Mencia, Gamay. That's actually six and I can't count. <laughs> um, and uh, easy drinking, medium bodied, red fruits and spice, the Kerners uh, say. Um, harvested anywhere between March 11th and April 9th. And uh, this is uh, made kind of similar to the Pinot Noir. Um, like literally very similar, just uh, aged for a little bit less time in those big food drawer for seven months instead of ten, and then stainless steel for another five. And um, uh, this is one of those wines that, like you know, like I actually did not taste this when I visited them uh, last uh, time. This wine hasn't been made yet, and this is one of my favorite, my biggest surprises from them so far, uh, because I think that there's a certain elegance and that there's a certain kind of like attention to detail uh, that goes into. Um, uh, this wine that is unexpected from a wine that's made from six different grapes. I was going to say, when, where else in the world do you get a blend of these six grapes? That's unheard of. I know, right? And it has this kind of soft kind of a quality to it, but it's deceivingly intense. Uh, it works for anything with, from um, octopus to grilled prawns 
to chicken. You can do this with veal. You can do it with mushrooms. I was going to say, I, I, from pork tenderloin is the first thing that kind of came to my mind. Ooh. With a little char on it. We're going to uh, we're going to a little place called Ungrafted tonight. Maybe uh, <laughs> maybe we'll have some pork tenderloin. Um, uh, this is a wine that I think uh, for us is quite indicative of uh, what. Adelaide Hills is all about today. Right. Um, Allison, you mentioned Pinot Noir, Riesling, Chardonnay. Um, these are grapes that have been grown here for, for quite a while. But now you see this new wave of Australian winemakers right. coming in and <laughs> they are attempting and experimenting to place grapes that people just really did not think were ever going to work in this region and they're having some success with it. Well, I think going back to kind of full circle from where we started with, um, you know, the trends that I saw change, um, in, you know, for, in the last 23 years, um, I think uh, to some degree you just planted Shiraz where you're supposed to and you just planted Grenache where you're supposed to and you just planted Riesling where you're supposed to, but they didn't do a lot of experimentation. So I think it's nice now, especially in places that have a little bit lower land cost, <laughs> hey. uh, to be able to throw in something like, well, the Savonine a bad example because they thought it was Albarino, but to throw in Gamay or Menthea mm -hmm. and just see if it works. And if it doesn't, no harm, no foul. Yeah. But clearly, mo most of them are working. Well, and uh, this is also just kind of goes to speak that, like, you know, all of these um, experimental kind of uh, plays on like seeing like you know Sangiovese and Pinot Noir we've seen uh they do actually make a gamay uh maybe yeah. we'll get some next year they made a total of 35 cases um I'm uh, very interested yeah. in that. so uh <laughs> things like Syrah, Merlot, Mencia are things that they are just now starting to uh play around with and that's why you only see them really in this red wine uh because there's just really not very much of it to go around but it's a testament to what is happening right now in Australia and in South Australia um, uh, we'll talk about soil here in just a second, but uh, one of the things that is fundamentally like mind-blowing to me is that Australia is one of the few places in the wine world that, sorry, there's a, uh, there's a bike going by. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that is fundamentally mind-blowing to me is that Australia is one of the few places in the wine world today that is getting colder in some places because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we all saw the terrible for, uh, the fires that were there in 2020 and you're going, Andre, what are you, what are you smoking? <laughs> but no, it really is the case that parts of Australia are actually getting colder. Uh, Margaret River, the place you talked yep. about, saw their first frost in 2019 since 1981. Um, you're starting to see that Antarctic Ocean, the Great Southern Ocean, play a larger influence in some of the wine regions here. And then you're seeing um, uh, more of these cold climate uh, grapes being planted in places that were historically just too hot to, to even think about planting them. And you're seeing young winemakers take the risk and right. take the opportunity to do something different in order to do so. Uh, now, they are, they are wanna... specifically planting them in clay. <laughs> right. But before that, can you give them the fun fact of the fifth ocean? What? The Great Southern Ocean? I didn't know that it was a thing. Yeah, yeah. Last year, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly who the governing body for that is, <laughs> uh, came out and said that uh, that big old piece of water that goes around the entire planet um, is not just parts of the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Ocean. Right. It's its own ocean. It's the Great Southern or the Antarctic Ocean. Yeah. So throw that out at your next trivia night. Mm. It'll impress somebody. Um, uh, but, but Yeah, we were talking about um, what makes Adelaide Hills so so cold and you know we've kind of touched upon it with the pinot noir uh and then and a little bit more with the rouge but uh all of these um soils are um over clay loam right yeah. and so do you want to talk a little bit about how that affects the wines yeah let's do it um so clay is a soil type that essentially retains water and um uh, it is something that uh, the french uh, figured out uh, pretty well um, to control yield. Now, sometimes uh, when you get to places like Burgundy and you get to places like Bordeaux, you have grapes like Gamay and Merlot, respectively, uh, that uh, you want to tamp down how much fruit they produce. Otherwise, they make pretty uninteresting, pretty boring wines. Um, uh, and if um, you grow them in clay, what clay does is, is it retains water. Water um, uh, goes, uh, decreases temperature as the night um, uh, falls. 
and then it takes longer for the soil, the temperature of the soil itself, to warm back up right. in the morning. And so while on top of the, uh, the soil, it might be 60 degrees, in the root system where all of the actual ripening and the transfer of sugars and all of the maturation that makes the wine ripe in the alcohol sense um, uh, takes place, that water is still cold. So it slows down the actual retention of, um, of uh, those uh, sugar uh, molecules to, that turn into uh, to alcohol, and it makes the uh, grapes uh, take longer to ripen. Um, if they take longer to ripen, it also gives them more aromatic profile, and it also gives them a uh, flavor profile that is more concentrated and more dense, and that's why they do it. And I think just a, a parallel with this is, is Bordeaux, really, mm -hmm. right? I mean, because Cabernet Sauvignon can't ripen in clay, so mm -hmm. that's why you see Merlot on, on, on the other bank. Yeah. You know, so left bank Cabernet, right bank more Merlot, and that is because of the clay soils. Yeah. So just a, a little parallel um, for you. All right. So with that, I think uh, we've uh, reached the end of our little tasting here. Um, uh, we want to thank you once again uh, for uh, joining us for uh, yet another episode of uh, What's in Your Box this month. Um, this is uh, the lovely Alison Gorsuch. Thank you. Can uh, I have two cases of this, please? Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, this is uh, going to be a great opportunity uh, for you all to uh, visit these wines, hang out. These are drinking wines for the summer. Um, obviously, they're coming to you in June. And uh, this is a, a great opportunity for you. If you wanted to learn more, go on to blisswineconcierge.com um, where you can uh, join our mailing list, get the newsletter from uh, Allison. You can join our wine club and you can also join um, uh, our uh, wonderful family that just purchases uh, wines from us a la carte. Uh, from uh, the lovely inner Richmond district of San Francisco, we are signing off. Cheers. Cheers. And until mm -hmm. next time. Good night, everyone. <laughs>